one of the best nights I've ever spent on a canal in the UK. It was absolutely superb. Well, hello, you just catch me reminiscing. We're here today on the Grand Union Canal in West London. A very long stretch, this one, and historically really important to me personally, as, to, as well as to carp fishing itself. It's 37 miles, this stretch between locks, with two arms. One that goes out to Slough, and one that goes all the way into central London, into Paddington. And this, and this stretch is so important because it was at this actual spot that However many years ago it is now, it seems like a lifetime ago, I've got to be honest. Danny Smith caught the British record canal carp from here, a fish that absolutely stunned us, blew us away. And a culmination of a lot of years fishing on this particular stretch to learn about the fish. It was very different then, you know, big carp. These were escapee carp um, had escaped in the, in the big floods of 1988 when we had that big storm. And a lot of the big old famous Leany carp got into the river and subsequently got into the Grand Union Canal. 22 miles away from here, would you believe? But they came through, I think it was 14 locks in total, until they got to this stretch and took this up as their home. Big carp need cover, we know that. Um, and it was here that we chased them. But it won't be here that we're going to be chasing carp this time around. We're going to go quite a bit further back towards my, my area um, to somewhere a lot quieter uh, and hopefully we'll catch a carp or two. This was a pretty important spot to be fair when I was growing up. If we, in fact, I'm going to put some pellet here because when we come back, they may well see what happens here is this is the river, the River Colne, which comes down through here, but it's also connected to the canal. So all the fish from all these bits of river and that used to go up the channel there and spawn up at the water company. And you'd get like most of the time, there'd be no carp there. And then for a couple of weeks a year, they would flood in from everywhere. You'd be gobsmacked that there were so many locally for them to. Like I said, one year I counted over 100 carp and then gave up counting and they were big ones, some of them up 35 pounders and that was, I reckon, probably 30 years ago. Sounds mad now, doesn't it? On the canals, and I still marvel at it even to this day, is like modern carp fishing has boomed in the most incredible of ways, but the canal still remains relatively unfished. Why? I don't really know. People just want bigger fish, I guess. But the truth is, you can still have your little mission. You can still have your little bit of coming down, picking a spot, baiting up, and that's exactly what we're doing here. We're looking for a couple of clean spots that I can put a bit of bait in and keep popping back on my bike rides and topping up every three, four, five days until A, I have a sea activity in the spot, or B, I come and fish it. Um, we could just drop in cold, but dropping in cold on stretches with an unknown stock is folly. You know, you have to try and tilt the odds in your favour somewhat. And that is just by preparing an area with food. You know, they might feed here twice over the course of the few days that I put this bait in, but they will keep coming back and checking it. And that's all I'm trying to do is shorten the odds. Always shorten the odds from very lengthy odds, because there's a lot of canal here with and I really don't know how many carp are in this stretch um, and we're just trying to localise a few carp to get it, make it that little bit easier when we come to film and fish. Canals are usually pretty bland but in the, in the instance of this section of the Grand Union we've got a million features you know people always say look for cover, look for cover, look for boats, look for lily pads, look for, we've got it all here in abundance. Not only that but we've got two rivers flowing into this stretch which even today like we've had no rain from Weeks and weeks and weeks, still got nice flow going through, a lot of water movement, better oxygenation, should just be a better stretch for fishing full stop. But primarily what I'm looking for to prepare a spot is something hard, a dinner plate, I need a dinner plate. All these spots of like chucking one up the back of the boat and yeah, you can catch them like that and we've caught hundreds of canal carp over the years by flicking rods everywhere and fishing in that style. But for the purposes of this filming, I'm baiting with a view to coming back and fishing. So we're just trying to shorten odds. So we'll always think of shortening the odds. And on a stretch like this, where the carp could literally be anywhere at any time of year, I'm just trying to localise a few so that when we come back and fish, we've got a quicker chance of getting one.
Whew, what a walk that was, let me tell you. I've chosen this spot to film at because I haven't personally fished here for well over 20 years, probably nearer 30. Um, but it was always a spot that I held dear in my heart because I remember all those years ago, it must have been more than that because I remember being a young, young and I was probably out on my bike and I remember walking up to the edge here and seeing two or three carp feeding there, literally there with their tails up. And like, if you're getting on for 30 years ago, like that would have made a big impression on me. Um, and I did fish here, but because of the walk and stuff like that, I always had big plans to come back and do it, but you know how it goes, never actually got round to it. But I did fish this stretch in the winter, later that year or the year after. Um, but this spot that I've bought, walked all this way to show you, I mean, look, you've got the first river on the stretch coming in. This is the end of the stretch, the lock is behind us. So we've got this lovely river coming in, all full of pads and up, up that channel is all super snaggy. And you just know, even though I don't know if there's any carp in this stretch, you sort of just know that if there are any, that this is the sort of spot you're gonna catch one. Right, well, I'm gonna put a little bit of bait in here because I love the look at this spot so much. It looks like it's classic carp spot, innit? I mean, if, you're not, if you've never seen this bit before on this canal and you see this, you'd be like, oh, I know there's one or two live there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a bit of bait in. You've got that sticky deep bit where it drops into the main channel of the canal. All of where the pads are is obviously like a silt trap and it's all, the further left you go, the softer and softer and horribler it gets. But just down here, when a minute ago, when the canal was flowing as the lock was emptying, there was a little back eddy here. I dropped a lead down, crack, crack, crack. Oh, lovely times. So I'm just gonna put a little bit of bait here. I'm not gonna put lots here, a few handfuls of pellet, a few tigers and a few boilies, more than I need to, but I'm quite happy to go away from this for a good few days now and let it work its magic. If I was going to be really honest with you, and I was like sitting down like in the old days to write a magazine article or do my bit, like I'd always say, you know, a classic spot for this or a classic spot for that. Well, as canal spots go, this stretch is just offers everything to the angler. Got two adjoining rivers, got a huge stretch of houseboats, we've got loads of cabbage, loads of little tiny offshoots full of lilies, lots of overhangs, lots of snags in the water absolutely everything that an angler could look for where carp might reside, this stretch has got it. So that's partly the reason that I've chosen to bait and have a little go here, but also partly because it's beautiful. It, it gives you, you know, I know for a fact that had I not seen this, this little spot here that I've just baited up, you know, if I was sat at home watching it, I'd be like, yeah, that looks the part, you know, that looks like a really good spot for a carp. So I've chosen it on its merits as a, as a stretch to hold carp. I've chosen it on its merits as a stretch, as having holding areas, i.e. boats, bridges, all the bits and bobs. And I've chosen it because it's typically English and really very beautiful midsummer. Um, and I'm really hopeful that with a little bit of prep, we can get a bite here. Well, we're back again, a long walk from the car. I've got a couple of rods out. 
This is one of the spots I've baited on this stretch. It's got two rivers adjoining this stretch. This is the lower of the rivers. My first choice of swim and my swim for tonight to actually where I intend to spend the night, there's someone fishing in there. That's the way of the world. Um, so we've brought, dropped back down here on the second river. This is the river entrance. Uh, give it a couple of hours till the evening and then hopefully we'll be able to scoot back up there for my main swim for the night ahead. Obviously there's many things to consider when you're choosing a spot to fish on the canal, not least the amount of people, the, you know, the towpaths are busy and stuff, but looking at the time of year, we're now filming, I think it's July now, we've just come through a period of really hot weather, at, you know, 30 degree plus for, you know, a few days in a row. Obviously, if the fish haven't spawned, they're going to have spawned in that hot weather. Um, I chose this stretch specifically, although I've not fished here for 20 years, I wanted to make it as real as possible. Um, I did fish here in the past, and the reason we did so well on this stretch was because it's got two rivers adjoining, so it becomes what they call a running pound. So even in foul hot weather where it's still, there's no oxygen, you've still got some water movement, the fish remain active. But moreover, because of the heat, I expected them to either go up this river or up that river and do some spawning. So I've come down, I haven't really put a lot of effort in, I've baited a couple of times, hoping that they drift in and out of a night and that's the thing with canals you know most of your activity is very early morning or through the night just because they're busy during the days with boat traffic people and you know what it's like the second it quietens off like you get to the sort of witching hour around midnight on the canal and that's when it usually comes alive so although we're not expecting anything at the moment i've dropped down here into this spot because like i said earlier there's somebody in my spot further up canal and we're just going to sit here have a little watch you know even if we don't catch any no time is wasted Hopefully we'll be able to see something, we'll move up to our spot, do the night, come back down and have another go here in the morning. Right, that's us at this spot. We weren't really expecting any, but it is one of the spots that I trickled a bit of bait in, and it is a lovely looking area. But it's almost certainly, like most canal spots, to be fair, a night spot. I think if we stayed here, there's every chance. It's my belief that the carp are up the rivers. They've probably been spawning in that warm weather, but at night they will definitely trickle out back into the main canal. And I think if we stayed here, there's every chance of a bite. But my number one spot is equally as nice, just back up there. We're gonna pack up now, get up there for the night. It's nicer to film, it's a bit quieter, a bit more private and you know there's a lot of people live here and we don't want to cause problems so we're going to get up there and do the night up there now. Cafe. Well, we're all set up. It's a lot nicer here, a bit secluded. If you can hear the noise, it's the, uh, the locks are so old, they're broken and the water just spills over. It's got its charm, it puts you to sleep, if nothing else. Anyway, we're, um, we're at my number one swim for the night ahead. I chose this swim, obviously, for many reasons. I talked about that a bit before, but it's at the head of the stretch, river comes in. I've baited here a couple of times now. I've got everything ready to go. I'm just gonna put a real simple rig, just a bottom bait rig with a Krill tough bottom bait, a little bag of oily pellet and I'm going to lower. I could have used two rods here, but really, you know, you just, if, if I can't get one on one, I'm not going to get one on the other. So one rod directly in front of this wall here, it's a little bit deeper um, and I'm hoping when I drop a lead in, it should be a little bit firmer and a bit cleared from the last time I was here because since then I've been here twice, came up twice, once late in the year, no, both, no, sorry, both times at dawn, got up at four, crept up here, all misty and silent, baited it with pellet and a few boilies went away and came back a week later, did the same thing. I say a week later, five days. And uh, yeah, five days later from the first baiting, but two days ago. So I've only, I put, I put a lot less in this time. I came up again early in the morning, spray a pellet, a few boilies. Hopefully it's done its work. 
and there's a carp or two to be caught. You never know. Oh yeah, that's lovely. Nice and clean. light is just starting to go we've had a little bit of dinner I got me rod out we're a couple of bream in already bream or hybrids whatever they were um, obviously the bait that I've been putting in has obviously been going um, and while we were sat there we had, I heard a splash up the river and a coot squawk um, whether it was carp or a chub we're not sure but it's a good sign it's looking good the weather's absolutely a1 perfect carp weather and we're hopeful, like most canal fishing, that once it all the towpath quietens down and everything like settles down for the night, the carp will come out to play. Well, morning everyone. Um, blustery night, Brolly blew away several times. Uh, Bert was fidgeting about. No mosquitoes here, which was a massive bonus, um, but no carp either. Um, we baited up, we dropped in. We had a couple of bream yesterday evening, a couple of hybrids. Um, there was the odd bubble and that, and it looked for all the world like there was a really good chance here. On paper, it's a lovely spot, and to film, it's a lovely spot. But I lifted the rig out at just after first light this morning, no bait on the end, so there's obviously lots of crayfish here, which they never used to be, but of course they're all through the canals and river systems now anyway, so it's not a surprise. Um, so yeah, no bites, although I've sort of got an excuse because I didn't have a bait on all night, but I don't think there was any carp here anyway. So what we're going to do is quickly pack up, go back to the spot we were at yesterday, because that really rung my bell. It looked, looked a much better spot to me, but it was difficult to film there because there's so, you know, so little towpath to set up on. So we'll go back there, have an hour, and then we're going to have a re rethink um, and possibly shoot off somewhere else for the day where there's a chance of a bite, maybe a different bit of the Grand Union further up, up, up that way or we'll mosey on down to our spot for the night ahead, which is another spot where the river's coming in on a stretch, two or three stretches down. Um, and hopefully we'll be a bit more successful there. I had a crayfish on it, <laughs> so I lifted it out. Yeah, look, he's already, he was hanging on to it. Yeah, I think a uh, life expectancy of a, of, a, of a rig in this spot is probably about half an hour. That's literally, I, I've only just put that back out with a fresh bait and bag, but yeah, they're here, so. late because I've got the stupid camera team in tow they're like like a ball and chain so everything's got to be done like at their pace where normally I'd be up at four drop it back in give it 20 minutes if there's no liners or nothing's about I'd have been straight back down here I knew this was the spot yesterday it just looked better it's deeper the river that runs off it's deeper and I just got a feeling they've been last week 32, 33 degrees, they've been up that river spawning and they're probably still up there. But I felt if we'd have stayed here last night, they would have crept out and we might have had a chance. But that was true of the other spot. It just didn't pan out. So 
we've had a coffee, quickly come back down here. I'm only going to put one out, just a white pop-up. I've put a few boilies out before we left yesterday evening. I'm going to flick a rod out. We've got just about enough time till the sun comes over them trees and then that chance is gone. So we're just going to chuck one rod out, give it half hour, if they're about, we'll get one. Simple as that. <laughs> Well, it's 7.30 a.m. We moved down from the other swim for an hour, or half an hour, but this is the end now, 7.30 is about in the bite time really. The canal towpath's come into life, got lots of joggers and cyclists and whatnot, and just the noise builds and they ebb away. Um, but I just had that feeling that these fish are up the river from last week's warm weather spawning, and um, no bites. So, that leaves us in a bit of a dilemma. What do we do now? Well, daytime fishing on the canal isn't great at the best of times. Um, but we're gonna head to an area of the Grand Union Canal that used to be really very prolific. Just like the rivers, the canals run in pounds, you know, in sections, and, and no two are the same. You know, you can have a really cart-rich section and go down a couple of pounds, nothing, nothing, not even any silverfish. And then a fish-rich bit again, then nothing. Um, and it's just totally different. It's, even though it's one venue, it might, might as well be a thousand different venues, you know. So we're gonna, get, we're gonna head up to the Chilterns around the Tring area, very famous area for cart fishing in the past. And we're just gonna have a mooch about, see if we can catch one in the day. Um, just make the most of the time. Well, we've driven about, I don't know, three quarters of an hour or so from where we were before, the last, the last spot where we fished last night. And what amazing bit of canal. Eh? It's hard to believe like bits of canal that still exist in this country. But it just goes to show what the lockdown has done to the waterways of this country. Like, no boat traffic for the best part of three or four months. And it's just turned back to almost like this wild chalk stream. It's just incredible. You'll see from the drone footage like how clear it is. It's tap clear. But of course it being tap clear means that we can see the carp easily. And back in the day, like 10, 15 years ago, these were one of these were my like secret winter stretches where every single stretch held really good stocks of carp from from yay big all the way up to sort of mid 20s. But tiny, narrow, shallow. You can imagine it fitted the bill perfectly. They were always coloured, but you'd always see a few carp ghosting about and you could always, always get bites, regardless of the weather. I can remember being here many winter days, me and my friends, breaking holes in the ice, especially on this very stretch, lowering in and catching 20 pounders, like just stuff of dreams, really, when you look back. But, such is with the modern world, um, feast and famine, like what was once the most incredible bit of Grand Union Canal is now completely devoid of fish. We just walked four, maybe even five stretches. And um, you know, it's like a revelation after years of looking into murky canal water to suddenly be like, literally like a chalk stream, you'll see. But no carp. We haven't seen a single carp. In fact, the only fish bigger than sort of, so big we've seen was a couple of bream in one little bit that had a little bit more color. Um, and yeah, you know, from such a magnificent bit of fishing to just devoid in, in less than a decade. Predation, fish theft, whatever the reasons, you can't point it down to one particular thing. The fish are gone. And when they're gone, they can't be replaced. Um, so we made the drive up looking for maybe a daytime bite, which this area used to be famous for, but unfortunately that's not gonna be happening. So it's nice to see it looking like this, 
but it's tinged with sadness because all the carp are gone, quite literally. It's late afternoon now and we're at our second choice spot. We fished last night four stretches upstream, maybe, yeah, four stretches upstream. And although it was my first choice, it didn't prove to be the one. You know, you're, it's always a gamble with this sort of fishing. It's real. There's no distinct, like there's no, oh, how many fish are in this stretch? We don't know. There might be 20 or 30 in this stretch, might be five in that one. The only way you find out is by angling. And we've tried to do it as real as possible. So we fished last night up there. We got Cray, no bait on in the morning, dropped him in a couple of small hybrids or whatever. Didn't see any carp, didn't catch any carp. So rather than do the, tonight on the same stretch, a bit further down, we decided to hedge our bets and drop on our backup spot, which is here. The head of a beautiful stretch that I've fished an awful lot in the past, but I've never fished at this end of it. Will there be carp here? Do you know what? I can't guarantee it. If I had to put money on it, I'd say there's a very good chance. But also there's a good chance of a barbell here. We've got a lovely rib bit of the river coal joining here, full of big barbel, or certainly holds some big barbel. And on occasion they drift down and will drop down here and you can catch one. As of fishing now, we never usually set up this early. We're going to give it a little bit of time. We've got to have a look about and stuff. We'll drop in later on dusk, get set up, lower a couple of rods in, one at the river mouth, one a bit downstream. I baited here two mornings ago with about a kilo of boily and pellet mixed. Fingers crossed there's one about. Even though I've dropped my rig down here, and we've seen a bit of bubbling just before we dropped it down, obviously I'm throwing my boilies back up under the bridge, because it's actually, it looks quite pacey here, but the pace is on the surface, it drops down into deeper water, but then boilies quickly get swung out to about where the rig is, then they sink and they end up way past it. So the safest way is to just throw them right under the bridge here, and that gets them roughly about where the rig is sat. Well, I'm just about to get my second rod out. I'm only using two rods. I only ever really use two rods on the canal. Um, space, lines, pretty obvious. Um, right, my second rig, really simple, like it always is from me. Simple is as simple does. Um, cam soft, 25 pounds, super, super, super indestructible in most situations. Really simple, quick rigs to tie. When you're fishing on the canal, the river, you don't often just catch carp, you know, you get chubs, bream, whatever's about, it, quite often you catch them, they wreck your rigs, really, tubing, bits of bells and whistles, not required, not in any way, shape or form. Simple cam soft, straight through to the hook, you can see, size seven curve point, I've got loads of carp on these this year and they are my new favourite hook. A tungsten dropper, because we've got a little bit of flow, lots of small fish and craze about, and a straight out of the packet helicopter leader. Couldn't be simpler, I prefer to use a helicopter rig at all times, especially with this sort of fishing, flicking the boats, flicking under bushes, better drop, better straightening of the rig, the full, everything's much better. Lead clips, great as they are, they're a means to an end because I want to get rid of the rig, but they don't offer me the best presentation for swinging out and dropping, this does. So really simple, all I'm going to do to this, add a bag of oily munger, I'm going to plop it out, sort of six or eight foot to the left of the other rod, where the flow is ever so slightly slacker, and hopefully that'll be the one that does the cart.
Well, I've got something as quick as that. It feels weighty. Well, this is interesting. A quick bite like that. I think it's a barbel. If it is a barbel, it's a big barbel. But it snagged me on something and I really don't know what it is. I keep pulling it back and it will stop. So what we're going to do, professionals that we are, I think it might be gone. He's gone. I don't know what on earth it was snagged on. Looks absolutely perfect. Look, clink's fine. It was snagged somewhere and I don't know where, but that was just one of those, you know when you get mad occurrences? That was one of them mad occurrences sometimes against all the odds, or the other way round. Yeah, look, it was, it was, it's all furred up on the actual, on the leader. There's just something down there. It had run, it ran away, and went that way and snagged me. Still fizzing down there now, look, right, well, I've just lost it. And there was bubbling there before. I wonder if there's something there that they're either rubbing up against or, you just don't know, you don't know. But anyway, when it's exciting, got the old art going, I'm sweating, <laughs> right. Whatever it was, it was bloody powerful and felt very heavy and solid. I've got to be honest, it, it went off very quick like a barbel does, and it wasn't very edge shaky, but it, was, it had substantial weight. So maybe that was a carp, but I reckon it was probably a big barbel. Never mind, better luck next time, eh? If we were doing the evening, we'd sit the chairs here and just have the rods propped up against the wall. But obviously we're doing the night, we have to walk the rods down. And you can't quite see, but there's a real shallow bit here. It's probably about that deep and falls at a gradient like that into this pacier, deeper run. And that's where we've just had our bite, so we're gonna drop it back in there, same spot. And hopefully there's more of them about. Oh, that got me a bit excited, that did. Oh, do you know what, I'm hot. It's really humid, but what we just seen, you wouldn't have seen it, but I lost that. The bite, the fact that it was a hook pull. I'm not sure it was a big barbel. It probably was a decent carp. It felt really heavy and didn't feel particularly barbly. It shot off quick and then was heavy and, and then it snagged me. But two minutes after that, we saw a definite carp roll 100 yards downstream, 70 yards downstream. Like they're obviously here. I baited it the other morning early or the other night, I can't remember, but I put, I didn't put too much in, I probably put a kilo of boilies and pellets mixed, and there's loads of silvers here. They were actually bubbling as we put the rod in. Um, I don't know, let's hope, let's hope, don't want to jinx it, let's hope that that's not the end and uh, we get another chance between now and the morning. But yeah, exciting, isn't it? Pucker. Funny old world, isn't it? Some you win, some you lose. Can't get too, uh, too upset and down about it. It was nice to get a bite, wasn't it? A bit of excitement after a long, we had a long day, been a lot of places looking for carp and stuff, and we see nothing, nothing. Um, so to like come back to a spot, I dropped a bit of bait in, and that's the value of it. You know, you got back here, I'd done that a couple of mornings ago, dropped back in within five minutes, wallop, there's one on the end. Like, that's how it should be. That's how it should be. We were 85% there, the last bit, unfortunately, it fell off. Well, it got caught around something, I still don't know what it was. The leg call was a bit scuffed, but the hook was fine. That's, that's the canal life, it's like one second, whoa! And that's the thing, you know, they come through it, I'm gonna have to put something by my rods tonight. We used to carry white buckets so that we didn't get took out by bikes after dark. But the rods are out now. Hopefully we get a second chance, eh? it'd be just desserts really, we have worked really hard today. It's been really humid, funny weather. Last night I really pinned my hopes on getting one and it wasn't to be. Um, so really that threw a big spanner in our works. The crayfish are obviously really bad on the other stretch. We've come here, they could be bad here. They could be bad here. Um, 
but what we'll do is what we do on anywhere where, where there's a doubt over whether your rig's fishing and that is because it's here and I can walk down to it, I will. Just before I go to bed, I'll walk down, lift them up, check them, drop them back down again. Everything's still in situ, make no disturbance, good to go. This time tomorrow, let's hope we've got something nice to show you. Morning campers. Well, what a night. I'm struggling to get string some words together. I'm so tired. If, it, if I look bleary eyed, it is because I am bleary eyed. I have had 10 minutes sleep all night and that is no exaggeration. I lost that big fish on the, at the top of the stretch yesterday evening. I guess it was probably later on in the about 10, 10.30. I'd actually laid down and I was knackered. And everybody was starting to get themselves sorted out. I actually settled down for the night. Um, and then I caught a really big barbel. Well, ripping take, I thought, oh, couldn't believe me luck, I got another chance at a carp. It wasn't a carp, it was a big barbel, a double, easily a double. Really happy with that, but not what I was after. And Mr. Barbel ruined my swim. He made such a commotion, I was quite clear I wasn't gonna get any more chances. So it was either go to bed, or try and make something happen out of nothing really. So I went for a big walk. I walked about half a mile downstream to this spot and I sat there and rolled a fag and watched for 10 minutes and would you believe it, like the carp god smiled on me and a big carp sloshed out up the margin to my right. That was all I needed really. So it was back, kit, move it all round here. Like by that time it's half 12. Everybody's a bit tired, me especially. But within 10 minutes of being here, I'd seen several more big sloshes, like a real rare occurrence. And it actually turned out to be one of the best nights I've ever spent on a canal in this country. They were rolling and jumping. I put a rod out, started to get a few liners within an hour. They were rolling up to my right, but then one rolled in front of me and I just knew, I knew it was gonna go. And it absolutely howled off about half an hour later out of the blue. I heard a big fish jump. I'd literally laid back, shut my eyes and I had a real big fish jump just here, right in front of me rod tip. But of course it wasn't a fish jumping, it was a fish bolting from where it just hooked itself. And as I sort of came round, the rod was bent round, the clutch was howling. And I had the most incredible battle with the most incredible carp. Like you wait till you see, I can't wait to show you. A big, deep, scarred, like I was just over the moon. All the effort has come good, you know, and I've got just the most incredible carp to show you. Well, I told you it was a special carp, didn't I? Oh man, I don't think people actually realise, you know, a 30 pound carp in, in, a, in an English canal is nationally important. Still really rare, like really rare. There's not many people caught 30 pounders out of an English canal. And I'll tell you what, this one ain't far off. It's a proper stout Colne Valley whacker and I am absolutely over the moon that we pulled it out the bag at the last minute. I couldn't have asked with months of prep, I couldn't have asked for a result like this. This is an amazing fish. And <laughs> I'm absolutely over the moon with it. Well, I'm very happy with that. And you know what's next, don't you? We're off to the CAF for tea and medals. <laughs> and well deserved, I reckon. That is a proper Colne Valley Canal belter. And that's earned me at least one latte and a full English. <laughs> God bless you.